Um, Self-driving cars, this is a bit of an enigmatic image, mainly because I didn't want to put a crashed car on the screen. Um, so um, you probably, well, you may have heard that um, one of Tesla's um, cars, uh, one of its high-end cars, uh, had a fatal accident um, a couple of months ago, but it was only reported recently. Um, and um, the salient feature of which was at the time the car was in autopilot mode. And what happens by Tesla's account was that it, uh, there was a, a tractor trailer pulling out in front of the car, which was white. The sky behind it was very bright. Neither the car nor the driver apparently could differentiate between the tractor trailer and the background. And so it ran into it and it took the top of the car off and the driver died. The reason I think this is because this is a piece of art called White Square by Kasimir Malevich, um, who was a, a, um, a suprematist painter from Russia. Um, and um, what he was trying to do with this was basically to reset art, to kind of remove all of the ideas about figurative art, and this is basically a challenge to the viewer. Um, he did another painting, which is more famous, called Black Square, um, which you can probably guess what that looks like. Um, there's a whole story behind that as well. Um, the reason I put this here is because, in a way, it's not what a self-driving car experience is. Um, it's probably moot to say that self-driving car experience is anything, really. Um, but it gives you an idea of... of we don't know how a self-driving car views the world or sees the world or thinks about the world. It's as enigmatic as that is. Um, so that's the problem. You know, when we're trying to work out how self-driving cars work or how they, you know, what their pluses and minuses are, you're trying to essentially interpret what it sees, how it views the world. So the good stuff about self-driving cars, um, you have greater safety. I mean, at this point, it's probably reasonable to say that, that uh, self-driving cars would be safer than cars driven by humans. The Tesla accident was, um, by their account, um, the first one in 130 million miles driven on autopilot, which compares with about 60 million miles for human drivers around the world. Um, so that's a fairly significant increase in, in safety. The other feature of that is that, um, that as soon as a given car has an experience and uploads its information to Tesla, every car in the fleet can become safer. Um, you know, you learn something, you can tell a few people about it, but if you get better at driving because of a close encounter, that doesn't mean that somebody else who drives the same model of car as you becomes safer. That does happen with artificially intelligent autonomous cars. So you can expect this to get safer and safer and safer. So that's a good thing. Uh, free time. Um, for those who have ever been, I don't know if anybody drives to work, probably not here, but, but if, you, if you resent commuting or if you resent the school run, uh, if you resent driving on motorways, this can only really be a good thing. You know, you don't have to sit there and with your hands on the wheel anymore. You can talk to your friends, do whatever you want. Um, the mock-ups of self-driving cars feature all sorts of exciting ways for people to talk to each other and you know, interact and all the rest of it. Um, so there are two good pluses there. There are actually quite a lot more, but um, for the sake of time, I won't go into all of that. So the bad really is boils down to it's not great news if you drive for a living or if you just really like driving um, because essentially if you're a cab driver, your services are not necessarily required anymore. If you're a delivery driver, similarly, um, and that obviously has consequences for everybody who depends on those networks as well. Um, the cab drivers, that's a relatively limited thing. Delivery drivers then changes the entirety of logistics and transportation and the, the movement of goods. And recreational drivers, I think, goes without saying, really, if you love to put your foot down on the M1, then or for M4, actually, more likely, um, you're out of luck. So the neutral, or the, uh, or the consequence of this is, um, is that human factors become important in ways that we don't really understand at this point. There are ways, actually, that the aviation industry has had to get used to, because obviously the aviation industry has had um, autopilot for a long time. So there are a bunch of things here. Um, there's loads of things, actually. But, um, so one of them is that um, the term autopilot makes people think that you don't have to do anything. That's actually not the case um, in the case of the Tesla car. You have to actually be paying attention because it only does certain things. How do you explain what range of things it does and what range of things you do? Um, that's a problem. I mean, it's a branding problem, but it's a communication problem as well. Um, you don't really know how you can say everything's fine apart from this condition when you'll have to take the wheel again. You don't know how to keep people alert so that if something does happen, if a tractor trailer pulls in front of you, then it will say, I don't know how to deal with this, can you do it, and that you'll react in appropriate time. That's a difficult problem. Um, you don't know, and this is kind of where we, I mean, you don't know what to do in the event that you have to make a choice between the person driving the car and people outside the car. Um, so you've got a self-driving car. And if you recall, what a self-driving car is looking at is that mysterious white blob. Um, so you don't really understand how it sees the world or how it judges it. Um, you come into a situation where the car can save you know, the driver by plowing through a crowd of pedestrians, or it can save the pedestrians, but it kills you. And that's very reductionist. In the real world, you know, things are never that simple, but nonetheless, let's take that as a problem. 
There's a whole school of psychological literature about this called the trolley problem. We know how this works in humans. We know what, what people's preferences are and what people think is fair, although it's frequently not rational, but we understand that. We have no idea how a car would assess that. We have no idea how to tell a car how to assess that. So we have this problem. You know, um, this is going to occur at some point, particularly when kids start realizing that if they run out in front of a self-driving car, it'll screech to a halt, and that'll be hilarious for all concerned, apart from the driver, right? You know, but, um, so this is going to be a problem, um, and human behavior, when, they real when people realize what you can do with these cars, is going to be a problem. Um, so who do you sacrifice? If it's a driver, if, if I say to you, come and buy my self-driving car, it'll kill you if it needs to, you're probably not going to buy one. You know? On the other hand, if it's the pedestrian, that doesn't seem very fair, given that you've got a better chance of surviving in your car than the pedestrian does on the street. And there are, real, I mean, there are obviously real consequences to this, but we have a real-world example of this. Um, so um, in India and China, um, which are obviously two of the, the big car-owning um, powers of the world now, so in India, um, the fear of being um, implicated as the cause of an accident or being involved in an accident is so great that the vast majority of people involved in road accidents receive no help. Um, there's a campaign running to try and make people into good Samaritans because essentially nobody will help if you're in a road accident in India. Well, not nobody, but very few people will um, because they are afraid that they will get hauled off and held responsible and you know, end up in jail or, wherever, or worse, depending on the you know, street justice. So that's one situation in which this doesn't make a lot of sense. In China, the fiscal penalties, the financial penalties, are such that it's cheaper to kill someone than it is to injure them. Um, if you kill them, you have to pay a small, relatively small fee, well, not small, but you have to pay a fixed fee. If you injure them, you have to look after them for the rest of your, their lives. And so, um, in a minority of cases, um, people kill people they've run over. Um, and that's something that happens. And this is, but that is the power of the social context within which these things work. So you have to get this right. You have to get this right, because otherwise, the consequences are both very hard to foresee and very possibly not in anyone's, well, not what anybody would think of as a, as a positive outcome.